Well, hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Carrie Collins. This is week 17 of Life Renovations. I've learned that you have, or you've learned that you have complete power over all things you come in contact with through your mind. And you have the ability to control how you perceive every situation and how you react to it. And you've probably noticed that your mental attitude, strength, and confidence has drastically increased since you started this course. And now that you're functioning from this mental powerhouse, I wanna talk you through today about building up one of the strongest parts of your mind. It's your intuition. Now, most of humanity sees the world through their five senses in, a, in like a waking state, and they accept what they see in their beta state of mind. Now, you know that insight happens at a faster vibration in the gamma state. We talked about that weeks and weeks ago. The doorway to gamma, to getting to those gamma rays, is only through theta consciousness, which is accomplished through meditation, visualization, two things you've already done, and today's lesson, continuous concentration. A continuing concentration or continuous concentration is an even and uninterrupted flow of thought, and it's the result of being patient, steady, and persistent. All great discoveries came from this process. It's a long, continued investigation. Like the discovery of the Titanic, it took years and years of hard work and effort, but also lots of study time and contemplation to know where to even look. Now imagine what you could discover if you put that kind of energy into your life's purpose. Now it seems like so much effort, doesn't it? I mean, it really does. But when you consider people who make these great discoveries, it's not just a nine to five job that they show up for and then forget it when they shut down their computer at the end of the day. Your life's purpose is something that, you, that should be so utterly ingrained in you and you should be so utterly obsessed with it that you think about it night and day. When you read about it, work on it, or talk about it to your friends, you're so engulfed that you're conscious of nothing else. Now this kind of concentration leads to intuitive perception and insight. Now have you ever seen like a little kid, like a young boy who becomes obsessed with a topic like dinosaurs? He's like the sponge and you take him to the library and he runs to the exact section of the library that has all the dinosaur books. He knows everything about all the different types and what they eat and how to pronounce all their crazy names. And he knows things like the brontosaurus wasn't a real dinosaur, but they have some fancy crazy name. People notice these obsessions in kids and they start to tell him facts and they buy him books and they take him to museums. And his mind becomes this magnet and his desire to know draws that knowledge to him. His demand creates the supply. And the same thing happens with you. Your desire is subconscious and incredibly powerful. The difference between you and a 10 year old boy is that he doesn't have any limitations. His obsession is encouraged. Often as adults, we're scared to show our obsessions. Like for instance, at one point in my life, I got completely obsessed with knitting, like crazy obsessed with knitting. I didn't tell anyone about it because I was afraid that I couldn't be judged for being a knitter, you know? I made a lot of scarves, I, you know, tons of gifts and things like that for my family, but people thought it was just kind of a habit, something new I was doing. Now I ended up spending a really snowy February living at my then boyfriend's parents' house in Indianapolis while we were transitioning between San Francisco and Chicago. Now his mother, she was super cool. She's a textile artist and she had all sorts of things that I could possibly need for knitting. She had books, yarn, patterns, needles. I mean, she saw that I was bored and she just kept throwing this stuff at me. It kept me busy for a long time. Now I knitted nearly every second of every day that month. For me, I was obsessed enough to master the skills in the book, like every single little special stitch and all the cables and mixing colors and making lace, and all of it. I mean, within a few months, I was teaching knitting classes out of my apartment in Chicago, and then I ended up having a, a knitting pattern published in a book. In fact, if you do a search for me and you look up Carrie Collins Knitting on Google, you can get the pattern for free. Obviously, I didn't sell it for very much. Anyway, it's a belt. It's pretty cool. Um, but the only thing that got me to that place was that I had an obsession and a lot of time. Had I been afraid for even a second, I would have never had such a great accomplishment. I mean, to be published in a book, that's a big deal. Now, fear holds us back from getting completely engrossed in any of our goals or desires. Now, I was lucky that I had tons of time, nothing else to do, and a little bit of awkwardness being around like my pseudo in-laws all the time. I would focus so intently on my knitting that the hours would just speed by. My attention was intently concentrated on my knitting and the desire to learn more. Now, all knowledge is the result of concentration. When you have the desire to learn something and the ability to concentrate, your mind can't help but suck in all the information you can find and make it your own. 
Desire comes from your subconscious and your subconscious mind lives in the present or your conscious mind, I'm sorry, your conscious mind lives in the present and makes decisions for you after you ask yourself questions. So when you say like, what do I want to do today? You could run through the newspaper calendar for a list of events that are happening, but it's your subconscious that attracts you to the things you really want to do. It's possible that you'd look at the list of events and think, you know, I just really rather knit all day. And that's your subconscious desire to obtain knowledge and new skill on something that you're obsessed with. Well, it's possible that the desire also fulfills some other needs for you, like escaping from your in-laws. <laughs> but whatever need it fulfills, concentration comes from subconscious desires. To concentrate fully, you have to have control over your body, mind, and spirit. Now we've been practicing for months, sitting still, inhibiting thoughts, relaxing your muscles, relaxing your mind, and eventually keeping focused thoughts in your head. Concentration is not easy for someone who cannot control these aspects of their being. So you've seen plenty of people who can't sit still. I mean, how can they concentrate when they're fidgeting and pacing around? You know people who are always worried and anxious. They can't concentrate either. Their minds are frantically jumping from one topic to another. Spiritually too, this is really important. If your desire doesn't feed your soul, you won't be able to concentrate either. Now, I was able to focus on knitting for a while, but once I didn't need that tool to escape from the people around me anymore, I wasn't able to concentrate on it anymore. And so I don't knit anymore. And sometimes we need to take a look at what we think we desire and see if it's contributing to our growth in the world or if it's allowing us to hide from the world. It's not much different than addictions. If a glass of wine enhances your dinner and relieves stress, then it can be great for your soul. But if an entire bottle of wine makes all the troubles of the world completely disappear, then you're not actually processing anything. The problems are still there the next day and no spiritual growth is taking place. Now that's an obvious example. What are some not so obvious examples? Well, how about watching hours and hours of football every weekend? Now, guys can get so obsessed about football but is it because it feeds their soul or because it allows them to escape from life for a few hours? These are things that need to be analyzed about your life. What are your escape tools? Is it shopping, reading, eating, drinking, television? What are they? Now, these are things that we desire, but maybe not for spiritual growth. It's important that we stick to our spiritual truths when we find ourselves desiring something. And it doesn't mean that there's not a time and a place for watching football or for shopping or for having wine. But spiritual growth happens when our desires feed our dreams and goals. So you have to be picky about how you spend your time. Now, what is concentration actually? It's not just sitting around and thinking thoughts. It's the ability to change your thoughts into values. If you want to reach your goals, you have to start the process of transmuting your thoughts. Fear of failure stops a lot of people in this process. And I've always been a big dreamer. I've heard many times that my goals are awfully lofty. My parents, though, were supportive in a very funny way. And they didn't push me, they didn't fund my crazy dreams, but they didn't get in the way either. In fact, my dad told me recently that he learned a long time ago that nothing he ever said would stop me from doing something I wanted to do. So he is just like, hands off, let me go. I reach high and I've fallen down a bunch of times. You remember the bike race? I mean, that was the big obvious fall, but I've fallen a lot of times. Even in my business, I plan things all the time that never happen. But when something fails, I don't look at it as my own weakness. I analyze the failure for physical, mental, or emotional limitations, and I get up and try again. Just because some plan failed once or twice or three times or 20 times, it doesn't mean you shouldn't try again. Each time you learn new things, when you repeat a process over and over, you learn how to do it better each time. Now, if you want to really achieve your goals, you have to be willing to brush yourself off and try again. This process has led me to teaching in three countries and at least nine different states. Now, I wasn't asked to do these classes. Nobody else set them up for me. I worked hard and I concentrated on my goal of filling classes in these areas because I wanted to go. In fact, I've taken paid vacations in the past couple years to Florida, Arizona, California, the Virgin Islands, Mexico, and London. In each of these places, I not only got to teach them about my favorite thing in the world, which is stretching, but they paid me for it. Each and every trip was only possible because I was able to change my thoughts into values. I concentrated hard on how to make these goals happen in real life without the feel of fear of failure. Now what you focus on is what you get, and I mean this in the most literal sense. When you focus on the problems in life, the drama, the news, the political issues of the day, and you do, that's the knowledge that you're attaining. Imagine if, instead of watching the news every night, you spent an hour reading about Spain. 
What knowledge would you rather have? What would fuel you spiritually? Knowledge about how many people died in Chicago last night by gunfire or what vegetable is newly contaminated with E. coli this week is information that will not lead towards a fantastic vacation in Spain. So what is it that you want? Everything you achieve comes from one simple formula. Attainment equals desire plus concentration. Now remember that desire is subconscious. It doesn't reason. It just gets to work. Desire propels us head first, full speed ahead into action. The more persistent your desire, the faster you go. If you truly want something with all your heart, all you have to do is concentrate on it and you can't help but figure out a way to get it. All your desires can be met in this way. In fact, it's the only way you've ever gotten anything you really wanted. Great thoughts combined with great emotions propel you up on the spectrum of positivity and things just start to happen easily for you. Think about it. When was the last time you had an intense longing to become something or to do something? Now that intensity of desire and concentration propels you forward at incredible speeds in comparison to something that you're being forced to do or forced to learn. When you want something bad enough, the little setbacks don't mean anything. It's like when you're running, it's a lot easier to jump over a tree in the road than if you're like shuffling along really slow. You have to climb over it. Now this intensity is the speed of your spirit. It gets bogged down in our mind and body sometimes, but when you're moving towards a goal that you really truly desire, you feel quick, excited, and light-footed. It's what people call happy feet, and it's a sign that you are 100% on the right track. Now, it sounds fantastic, and it is, but it takes hard work to get there. If you've ever had a nine to five job, you've actually started this process. Now, mark this down as the one day ever that I sing the praises of having a desk job. Write it down. When you are employed, you're learning the rules necessary for this type of focused concentration. Your mind stays steady and focused on your product or your project most of the time, sometimes not, but most of the time. You learn that one of the greatest virtues in the office place is efficiency. Now, when I was 12 years old, I read the book Cheaper by the Dozen by Frank Gilbreth. Have you guys read that book? It's a great book. The basic plot is that the father is so obsessed with efficiency that he had 12 children because everything is cheaper by the dozen. It's just more efficient that way. I hate to say that this book changed my life because it's just a goofy classic young adult novel, but I have to say, it changed my life. Now the caricature that Gilbreth built of this father um, through these ridiculous stories of forcing his kids to be efficient, I mean even down to exactly how they use the soap so that you use the least amount of soap and the quickest amount of time to be the most efficient, I mean it made me think about my own life. Was I being efficient? Was I focused on the task at hand enough to get it done quickly and of the best quality? Now when you practice efficiency, you're able to strengthen your mind so that any distractions or impulses of your instinctive life, like your habits, they just pass by. Being efficient allows for really concentrated focus. Now we've learned that you can give your thoughts vitality through emotion. You know that once a thought is attached to words, it starts to take form. You also know that once a thought is heard or read, it starts to take action. Thoughts and words are vibrations. Now on a simple level, written word vibrates as a light wave until it reaches your eye and is processed as the thought associated with that light wave. Spoken word is a sound wave and it vibrates until it hits your eardrum and it's processed again as the thought associated with that sound wave. Your thought vibrations reach out and attract the things they need to construct and build. And when you concentrate, you're focusing your consciousness so intently that it becomes identified with the object that you're focusing on. It's like when you absorb food in your body, it gives you fuel. When you absorb the object that you're focusing on in your mind, it gives your thoughts fuel. When you concentrate with this kind of intensity, you start to build intuition. This is great. What is intuition? Well, according to Google, intuition is the ability to understand something immediately without the need for conscious reasoning. And most of the time we associate intuition with having a gut feeling and then finding out that that feeling was true. Like when a mom knows that her kid's in trouble, or when you just have this feeling that you're in danger. Intuition is a powerful tool, and usually we only recognize it when there's danger attached or some sort of synchronicity that makes it feel supernatural. If you focus on something that is extremely important to you, your intuitive power is set into motion. Thoughts are vibrations, and if you need a thought to get to someone, if you need, it, if you need someone to hear you, it'll find its way. Now I experienced this firsthand. I was traveling in Italy, 
before cell phones and even before email was something that you read every day. I had an overwhelming feeling that I should check in with my family. So I found a payphone and I called home just to find out that my entire family had been frantically trying to reach me. My grandfather passed away suddenly that morning. He had a heart attack. Now you could say that I called home just because it seemed like a good idea to call, but there's no denying that multiple people were concentrating on connecting me with my family by phone at that very moment. In fact, even administrators and teachers at my college were trying to figure out where we might be that day and how to get in touch with me. We didn't get back to our hotel. I mean, we were on the road the entire day. We didn't get back until about two in the morning. So I like to think that I picked up those vibrations and I made that call because I knew that I needed to. It was the only time I called home on the entire trip. I mean, I'm not that type of person that talks to my family every day. So if our thoughts travel in vibrations, just like light or sound, why can't we hear them halfway around the world? Intuition provides us with a pretty powerful protection mechanism. Now it's the gut feeling that tells you to like get out of a building that's about to collapse or to run away from someone who has bad intentions. And these are very important aspects, but intuition is so much more than that. Your intuition has the ability to solve problems that are outside the grasp of your reasoning power. We reason way too slow to be able to use reasoning ability when we do something physical, like walking. You know this. Imagine if you had to use reason every time you went up and down the stairs, or like when you're running. If you had to think about every step, you'd fall over. Now your intuition is like your brain when it's running. It has no need to reason because reasoning isn't efficient enough for the insight that the intuition brings. Now, sometimes intuitive thoughts come to us so suddenly that they startle us with deep truth. When I have these thoughts, it feels like I've been doused with ice cold water. It's like the truth we've been looking for slaps us directly in the face. Now, often it feels like it's coming from outside of us, like from a higher power. And I don't care either way if that's what you believe or you don't. It really doesn't matter. But what matters is that you can learn to cultivate it and develop it. Now you have to recognize it in the big moments, like calling someone who's been trying to reach you in an emergency. But you also have to recognize it in the small moments, like when you're working on a project and you suddenly have the answer, or when you're drawn to someone who happens to be the exact person you should talk to. Your brain is so much more powerful than you can understand. You have to give it the credit it deserves, and intuition will come to you more and more, and you'll learn to listen to it. Now, the best place to access your intuition is when you go into the silence and concentrate. During your meditation time, you'll notice moments of extreme clarity, listen to those moments, and you're building your intuition. As of now, you've probably set aside a good place and time where you meditate and focus at your home. It's important that you find space like this all over your world. Private offices are really important for this reason. But in a lot of offices these days, some people don't even have their own designated workspace. It's important that in your work environment, you find a place where you can spend quiet time thinking. So maybe it's a 10 minute walk, or maybe there's an atrium somewhere, or maybe it's just the bathroom. I mean, who knows? But to get quick and incredibly intelligent answers to your questions, you need to go in the silence to access your intuition. Now in the past few weeks, we've worked a lot on defining your life's purpose, and now it's time to concentrate on it and start manifesting the things you need for you to become the person you really want to be. So do you remember, way back a week one. You made three lists, external obstacles, physical obstacles, and mental obstacles that were limiting you from complete success. And you might find it interesting now to look back at those limitations and see how much you've changed in just four months. And we're gonna look at some new things this week that are similar, but this week I want you to look specifically at your life's purpose and list all the things you need to make your goal happen. So some, some of the questions I'm gonna ask are like, what physical items do you need to make your goal happen? Include their price and where to buy them so you know exactly what you need, how much it's going to cost you, you know everything. You're going to think about like what kind of help you need from the outside world. Who do you need to contact? Who can help you? Who can support you? Do you need financial assistance? Who do you need to call for that? Another thing, how do you or what do you need to learn to make your goal happen? So how can you do that? Do you need to go back to school? Can you call someone? Can you look it up online? What things do you need to know? What resources do you need for your goal to happen? Can you do it while you're working at your current job? Do you need more time? Is it part of your job? Do you need an office? Do you need an assistant? What kind of resources do you need? And then of all these things, I want you to list everything that you can start doing with the resources that you already have. Everything that you are already set up to do, 
So make a decision to start working on them by finding time when you'll concentrate fully on the tasks. So assign yourself time. Just like if you were working a nine to five job, you would schedule from this time to this time, I'm doing this. It's a, I'm, I'm having a meeting and this meeting is time for me to work on this stuff. Make it sacred time. This is the time that you work on your stuff. Like for instance, this class, Thursday mornings, this is when I work on this stuff. It's designated time and nobody is allowed to interrupt me during this time. All right, um, and then get started, get working. Next, I want you to list all of the things that you are not able to do now. How are you going to get the resources that you need? What fears are coming up regarding these things? Think about it. Like for instance, if you need a lot of money to do your goal or if you need to leave your job, you need to look at the fears related to this so that you can keep moving forward instead of getting stuck. And we're gonna take that into your meditation. So for your meditation, I'm gonna have you really concentrate on the things that you're gonna to need to accomplish your goals. Look at that final question from your journaling. I want you to sit in your meditation spot, relax completely, and try to avoid getting anxious because these are the type of things you're gonna get anxious about. So try to really pare that down. I want you to look at anything that you need to complete your purpose that you don't have access to yet. Concentrate fully on that one thing until you feel like you can fully identify with it. For instance, if I need five hours a week to work on a new project, I'll need to focus on what those five hours really mean to me. When are they? What will I really do during this time? How will I make it work for me financially? You can concentrate fully on what that thing really is. And then how badly do you need it? Concentrate on it like it's already yours and only focus on the highest thought vibrations. If you find you're feeling fearful, turn it around, focus on courage. If you feel like you're lacking, then focus on abundance. Remember, attainment equals desire plus concentration. If you really, really want something, you need to spend this time concentrating on it and it'll come to you. Your thoughts vibrate at a high frequency when you really desire something. The process speeds up dramatically the more you desire your goal. Your intuition is powerful and it has the ability to give you great insight from your mind, but a powerful intuition also has the ability to communicate your needs to others, just like my family trying to call me in Italy. Your thoughts set in motion the causes that guide direct and bring about all the necessary relationships and things you need to fulfill your life's purpose. So it's time to get started. Now for your body challenge this week, um, well, first, let's talk about last week. Holy moly, wasn't that fun? I, um, I definitely enjoyed myself last week. I may have taken it too far. I got a manicure and a pedicure, a haircut, a 90-minute massage, a Reiki session. Um, I stretched. I, um, I went to like three concerts. I mean, it really like, I just had a, a fantastic week and I feel so good this week after really giving myself the quality of life that I deserve and pampering myself a little bit. Um, but a few weeks ago, I talked to you about how your body responds to pain and fear by building up layers of protection. Now these layers can cause all sorts of problems and the biggest one is structural imbalance or a bad posture. And the reason this happens is through something called compensation. Muscular compensation is when your brain sends a signal to the wrong muscle because the right one is out of commission. So let me give you a, an analogy, a story. I have two sisters, Trisha and Katie. Katie's my younger sister, and she just had twins, and she lives in Chicago. Now, Trisha's my older sister. She lives in Columbus. Trisha and Katie are really close, and they talk all the time. But when Katie was in labor, she wasn't really available to talk on the phone, so Trisha called me to find out how Katie was doing. She also asked about how I was doing. So, you know, the phone conversations with Trisha became a lot longer and more intense now that I had to fill her in on my life and Katie's life. Now it's been two months and the boys are home and they're so adorable and everything's great. Katie's pretty busy. So, you know, taking care of twins, she has the ability to pick up the phone and talk to Trisha. She does. But Trisha still kind of assumes that Katie's pretty busy and still calls me to find out how she's doing. So again, my phone calls with Trisha are still longer than they've ever been. And I don't mind it because it's really great talking to Trisha. And I see Katie enough that I can fill her in on the happenings of what's going on. So would it be better for Trisha to talk to Katie directly? Yeah, it totally. It would be so much more efficient because I only know so much about what's going on in Katie's life. But Katie's tired and it's nice for her not to have to talk to everybody all the time. And she doesn't really have the time for it, although she could. Now I, on the other hand, love talking about my nephews. So I have no problem with these long phone calls. 
So what on earth does this have to do with muscles? Trust me. Your muscles act just like my sisters and me. When one goes out of commission through an injury or overuse, the brain just sends a signal to another one that has the ability to jump in and do its job. It's a good thing because our body has the ability to save us in a crisis if we get hurt. But the problem is that our body doesn't reset itself. It will constantly call up the wrong muscle and the wrong muscle doesn't mind too much until it starts to ache from doing someone else's job. And the only way I've found to stop this pattern is through resistance stretching in a very specific pattern. Now stretching in this way talks to the brain and set it, sets it straight. It's kind of like Katie finally picks up the phone and calls Trisha and says, you know what, you can call me now and then I'm off the hook and I can rest. Now this week, I want you to do your stretches in a very specific order. You'll be resetting your neuromuscular connections. If you follow the same rules as before, you always resist, always move and stay out of pain, you're gonna start feeling really good if you do them in this order. Now remember that seeing a resistance stretching trainer for a private session can remove these imbalances almost instantly. So if you're struggling, just contact me about setting up a session. We could probably do it in one, in one session, but it, you can do it yourself. Now basically what you're gonna do for the new order is you're gonna do four stretches in a very specific order. Do four of each, and then after you've done four of those four stretches, you're gonna go back and repeat the exact same four stretches again, and then move on to the next group. Now you repeat each group until you've finished all the stretches, but feel free to do like arms one day and legs another day if you need to save time. You don't have to do them all in one sitting. All right? Now the diet challenge again, last week, Oh, the fruit. I ate so much fruit, I didn't even know what to do. And it's beautiful, and I feel so good, and um, I loved having it in my house. For your diet challenge this week, I'm gonna ask you to do something completely different than we've done diet challenge-wise before. I want you to step out of your comfort zone. And for some people, this won't be a problem because they're used to it, but for some, it's gonna be a huge challenge. So I want you to tell the waiter at a restaurant to make a substitution for your meal. Just a comfort zone challenge. Now when I was going through an allergy rotation diet, the list of things I couldn't eat were like leagues bigger than things that I could eat. I actually had to go through or go to specific restaurants that I knew catered towards people with allergies so that I felt more comfortable. I had these visions in my head of everybody rolling their eyes at me when I ordered and the cook spitting in my food because I was so, what a horrible person to ask them to make something without cheese. Now, I've been living with all these dietary restrictions for over 10 years now, and I've gotten over it, but I've learned a few tricks to getting really great meals at restaurants without feeling like I'm being a burden. So here they are. The first thing, use the internet. All restaurants have their menus up online these days where you can easily make a decision about what you want to eat beforehand. So I know right now I don't eat dairy. I just don't. So if a friend wants to go out for pizza, I need to look first at that restaurant and make sure that there are other options that I have at that restaurant. Like I could get a pasta dish or I could get a salad or, you know, I need to know what else is there. But some pizza places, it's like just pizza. So you gotta know which ones to go to. Um, you could call ahead to a restaurant. Usually if you call around two or 3 p.m., that's a safe time. Now many restaurants have gluten-free menus. So if you call them and ask them in advance, they'll have one ready for you. Now, at this time, like around two o'clock, three o'clock, most restaurants are just closing down lunch and getting ready to prep for dinner. So calling ahead and telling them your limitations will sometimes prompt a chef to prepare something special for you. Calling during off times means that you may actually be able to have a conversation with someone instead of just a real quick answer like, yeah, we have a gluten-free menu. I mean, you can actually say to somebody, this is, these are my limitations, what can you do for me? It's always a good idea to ask if the chef accepts substitutions, especially if you're going somewhere really fancy with a famous chef. Some famous chefs are like too proud to make changes or they say like absolutely no substitutions. Some places are weird like that. So it's good to know before you show up because you don't want to feel uncomfortable. When you're there, you can order a la carte. So I always look to see if, um, if they have things like add-ons, like you can get a salad, but if you want salmon on your salad, then that's an option. If that's an option, that means that they can easily give me a piece of salmon without having to go through any kind of hassle on the computer with their billing. Um, and you can get it pretty much plain, grilled, with nothing on it if you want. And the same goes for vegetables, and you can get rice, and you can substitute side dishes. Um, by ordering all these side dishes, you can have a great meal without all the fancy additions that you'd have in a main dish or without being really limited to what's in a main dish. Now next, tell your waiter that you're allergic. 
even if you're not, even if it's just a sensitivity. Nobody on a restaurant staff wants to know what happens when you come into contact with an allergen. Now for me, dairy causes me to have sinus problems and I get bloated for a couple days after I eat it. Now will I die instantly if I eat dairy? No, not at all. But if I tell a waiter that I'm allergic, he'll make sure that there's no chance or no cheese on my salad for fear that my head will explode in the restaurant and he'll have to clean it up. Now chefs are used to making substitutions. Uh, it does slow them down a bit, so never ever complain about waiting a little longer. And if it's a restaurant you frequent often, it's good to tip a little higher than normal for this extra care. I go to restaurants now that not only remember that I don't eat dairy, um, they'll actually make dishes specifically for me. So being a liked regular has its perks. And then lastly, look for dishes that are made to order, not prepared in advance. So I rarely look for like pastas or gratins or soups quiches, and things that are all mixed together. It's nearly impossible to change them, but like salads, sandwiches, and main dishes, they don't require much effort from the kitchen to change them. So remember, this week isn't about dealing with allergies as much as it is about stepping out of your comfort zone. If you don't have any dietary restrictions, think about some of the changes you've made in your diet over the past few months. Ask for some fruit on your salad and leave the dressing off. Ask for brown rice instead of white rice. Ask for more vegetables, especially if you're having a craving for one. Once I asked for four plates of arugula. I did, because I had a craving. If you're used to substitutions, really try to challenge the kitchen. See what happens. The important thing is that you realize that not only do you have the ability to control what you want to eat at a restaurant, it's actually very simple to ask for exactly what you want. You can have the quality that you deserve in life, and this is one way to see it physically and eat it, which is great. So that's it for this week. I hope you really enjoy spending some time bringing your life's purpose into tangible form. It's time to really get started and really start the process now that you know what you really want in life. And when you do, maybe you'll find your happy feet, which are great. So that's it for today. I'm going to let you guys um, log off if you need to, and um, we will go from there.